I want to tell you about the moment when I first discovered what I wanted to do for a living. I'm driving to work. It's early in the morning. I'm on Route 95 outside of Boston. It's November. November in Boston sucks. It's gray <laughs> and rainy and drizzly. And the traffic is not moving, which is true every single day on I-95. And I just want this commute from hell to be over. <laughs> and I'm drinking coffee and I'm flipping through the radio dial. And I come across a story on National Public Radio. And something about that particular story entrances me. I don't want it to end. I'm having what I came to know later is called a driveway moment, which is when you get where you're going, but you're so entranced by the story that you just don't get out of your car until the story ends. And something in me wakes up in that moment, and I fall in love with audio storytelling. And I decide in that moment, this is my living. This is what I want to do for the rest of my life. It took me 13 years to do anything about it. <laughs> so what I want to talk to you about today for the next few minutes is why so many of us never follow our dreams. Or if we do, we take forever to do it. And what we can do about that. Because there are things that we can do about that. So I'm driving on I-95. And I'm going to this job that everybody I know thinks is fabulous. And it is. I'm in my 20s, and I am the international editor of a major magazine. My employer sends me to Europe five times in two years. I go to France, and Germany, and England, and Italy, which I love. And it would have been glorious, except that the name of the magazine that I worked for was Datamation. And it was a major magazine in the computer trade publishing industry. And I had to write about things like operating systems, and standards, and middleware. And product managers would come to visit us to convince us to write about their products. And they would come and they would distribute these big diagrams with clouds and networks and arrows. And I would sit there with my fingernails in my palms, trying to be discreet, so that I didn't nod off. <laughs> Something was terribly wrong. And what was wrong was that I was caught between the desire for security and the perks and the desire to do something more creative and meaningful with my life. And the perks were great. I was well paid, I had a title I was proud of, and of course I was going to Europe like, every few months. It was fantastic. But I wasn't happy. And like all of us who've <coughs> ever been in a job that just doesn't fit I worried, I fretted. I thought, is this all there is? Is this job the best I can hope for? And this is all going through my mind that day on I-95 when I hear this story and I fall in love with audio storytelling. So there are two things I had always loved. I always loved books and I loved theater. And on that day in that story, I heard the perfect combination, this magical combination for me of both of them, writing and performing. But I have a problem, and that is that I have no confidence. I set those people on the radio apart from me. I knew I could write, but I had no idea how to get from here to the thing that I really, truly wanted to do. And so, I didn't. In fact, a couple years later, I even dated a man who knew everybody at WBUR, which is Boston's biggest public radio station. And he introduced me to everybody. I got a tour of the station. I met the guys at Car Talk. Does anybody remember yeah. Car Talk? They were funny, nice, they were fantastic. I talked to a news anchor who encouraged me, and still, I did not take my desire seriously. I left Damnation after a couple of years, but another high-tech publishing job came along, and it had a little more prestigious title, and a little more money, and the colleagues were so nice, and it was fun. And so I stayed. It still was not the right fit, and I still 
dreamed of doing that thing that I wanted to do. I dreamed of being in radio, and I was still stuck. So about two years down the road, my magazine is sold and I'm out of a job. But a recruiter comes along at exactly the right moment and offers me another safe job, which I take at Inc. Magazine, the Bible of entrepreneurship. And it has an even more prestigious title and a little bit more money and even nicer colleagues, which is hard to imagine, because I was blessed with just like the best colleagues all along my career. And it's fine, and I stay. But that itch never goes away. I am writing stories for the page, but what I am dreaming of is stories that come alive in my ears and in my head, and that entertain and that teach, and that have the capacity to expose injustice. I am dreaming of stories that can change the world. I am dreaming about this, but I am still not doing this thing. Ten years after I discovered Terry Gross and Ira Glass. And then, opportunity comes along in the form of a disaster. <laughs> My magazine is sold, and we are all out of jobs. But this time it is the end of 2002, and 9-11 has happened, and the internet bubble has burst. And there is no fairy tale recruiter coming along to offer me another safe job. And so what do I finally do? With my back up against the wall, I finally reach out and I call someone I've met at WBUR and I say, could I get an interview? And they shock me because they say yes. <laughs> and so I get dressed up in my little suit. I don't know if you remember 2002, but we were still wearing suits. <laughs> and I go into what felt like Oz to me. You know, public radio was like glittering and glorious, but forever down this yellow brick road, and I was sure that the Wicked Witch of the West was going to appear in a puff of smoke if I dared to take one step down that road. So I go sort of shyly into WBUR, and I'm hopeful. And I'm praying, and I wait for an hour for this interview, and it is the worst interview of my life. It lasts for 10 minutes, and I slink out of that radio station. And I am sure that I will never have a job at WBUR, or for that matter, any public radio station anywhere, because it's a pipe dream, right? So a couple weeks later, I'm sitting at home, and the phone rings. And it's somebody from WBUR, and they say to me, would it be possible for you to work for six months or maybe a little bit longer as a fill-in producer on a national interview program, one that is famous, one that is heard all over the country, one that I knew well? And I say, absolutely, are you kidding? I don't even care that the salary is less than half of what I've been making, which should tell you something right there. So that was the first of three jobs that I ultimately have had in public radio. I came to Denver about six years ago to work for Colorado Public Radio. And I've had the opportunity to do just about everything I wanted. I've done some fun, entertaining stories with chefs and scientists and mushroom hunters. That's a fun one to do. <laughs> and I've done hard, heartbreaking stories about brain damage and opioid abuse and abortion and immigration and police brutality. And then I left there and I produced a podcast called Hard Call, which explores the hardest decisions we're forced to make about our health through the lens of a single person's story. Stories about mental illness and end of life decisions. And all of this has led to coaching. And I recently co-founded a company called Podcast Allies, which is a training company to teach other people. I am doing this with a very good friend of mine. And we have the joy of teaching other people how to make audio stories. And we have the joy of being at the heart of this exploding podcast industry. So, what's the point? The point is that all of this would have been so much more fulfilling and fun and less painful if I had had the guts 
to go after my dreams and to start instead of waiting to be pushed. So I got to thinking, what could I have done differently? I couldn't go back 13 years, but I could learn. And so I did what any good journalist does, and that is I started to ask questions. I decided, I decided to start a podcast. Forgive me, I have to get the remote here. I decided to start a podcast called One More Shot in which I would interview people about their journeys and I would find out what obstacles they ran into when they were finally <coughs> starting to write that novel or get a new job or start a business and how they overcame them. And I met a wonderful singer-songwriter named Julie Geller. And Julie was about to start a recurring series of events called Setting the Stage. And she asked me, would I launch one more shot on the stage? And because she asked me and gave me the opportunity, I did it. Another kick in the pants. And that was the first interview. And I interviewed courageous risk takers who've done some pretty amazing things. I was not looking for Lady Gaga or Michelle Obama or Oprah. I wanted to know how people like you and me take big leaps in their lives. And the cool thing about it was that these people were really vulnerable with me. They told me about what they were scared of. They told me about their setbacks. They told me about those moments when they wanted to cry or throw up. And they also told me about the excitement and the meaning they found when they followed their curiosity and they took risks. Several themes came up over and over again, which I call the One More Shot Manifesto. And these are themes that, uh, these are lessons that help people overcome what are predictable obstacles to change. I'm going to share just a few, a few of them with you. This is Debbie Shear, who I see is now sitting in the front of the audience. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome, Debbie. I'm going to tell your story. <laughs> Debbie, but Debbie was, at the time, a stay-at-home mom of two very young kids when one day her life fell apart. Her partner came home and said, I'm sorry, I don't love you anymore. I want a divorce. And Debbie, as she told me, was devastated, but she was also terrified because how was she going to make a living with these two young kids? So she decided to do something that would not occur to any of us, I promise you, especially under these circumstances. She decided to try stand-up comedy. <laughs> I'm going through something so scary. I should probably find something else that's even scarier to take my mind off this really scary thing. <laughs> so Debbie is now a very successful stand-up comic in Denver and an MC and an auctioneer. And give her a big hand because she was really And if I could get this to go forward, we'll be in good shape. This is Denise Solaire Cox. Denise, every New Year's <coughs> Eve for 17 years, she wrote a resolution. And that resolution was, I will make a movie. But she was in sales. She had no clue how to even begin. And so, nothing happened. <laughs> I definitely sounded like one of those people, I was like, you know, one day I'm gonna make a movie, that's what I said. Like, one day I'm gonna make a movie and it's gonna be about all the stuff. One day I'm gonna write a novel. Yeah, yeah. One day, someday, when the plans are aligned, I always make a joke, I have enough money in my bank account and I'm a size six and fit into all my favorite clothes. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you been there? <laughs> yep. So the 18th year rolls around and she writes that resolution again, but this time she's really angry at herself and she says, this is the last time I am writing this resolution. If I don't do this this year, I'm done. I give up. And she took one little step. She called a person that she had heard of once who knew, she thought, had something to do with film. And it turned out to be an Oscar-nominated film director. 
who fell in love with her idea, became her partner, and now more than five years later, her film, Being Enya, has been screened all over the country. This is Vincent Puglisi. Vincent is a, uh, an award-winning sports photographer. He went from making $32,000 a year working for a local paper to $32,000 in a day with a new business. Not every single day. <laughs> and that sounds like it was easy, some fairy tale, but it was hard because even though he wasn't making very much money, it's not easy to turn down a secure job for something brand new that you don't know is going to work. And so this is how he got through. We start to do a million different things. And in the middle of my overwhelm and anxiety that I went through, I learned one thing, and it's the simplest thing you can learn, and it's the most important, is to be better than yesterday. And that's the only thing you really have to do. But if you're better than yesterday, I don't have to worry about what's going to happen in two years. If I improve from the day before, if I keep doing that day after day, all that other stuff works stuff out. The past doesn't matter, the future doesn't really matter because I'm shaping it. But it's so simple. Whenever I start getting overwhelmed, and I do, I always try to tell my wife tells me, be better than yesterday. And it calms everything down. Okay, you know, I don't have to do everything. I said, just to be better than yesterday. And it works. So Vincent now has a book out called Freelance to Freedom. And this is one of my favorites, Carrie Knudsen, a good friend. <laughs> Carrie is a school counselor who's been at the same school for 13 years. But about eight years ago, she had a dream of something additional she wanted to do. And she wrote it down in her journal, and she shoved that journal in a desk drawer. And this is what happened. And a few months later, I was meeting with a relatively new friend of mine. So I thought she'd be safe because she doesn't really know me that well. So I said, I want to say something out loud. And I just feel like I want to tell somebody. And she's like, OK. And I said, I want to do a one-woman show. And I whispered it like that. I don't know why, but I just was like, I want to do it. And she's like, why are you whispering? I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> but it's that thing that you're scared to say out loud that I said it out loud. And then the world, nothing came crashing down. No one was like, ha, ha, ha. Like, nobody said anything. She said, great, let's do it. Let's do your show. She goes, if you really want to do it, I'll help you. And I'm like, I really want to do it. And I need help to do it. And she said, let's go. And Carrie, that took about eight years, but Carrie now has performed her one-woman show called Ain't Never Met a Stranger at the Clock Tower Cabaret several times in front of a sold-out audience, and now she is touring around the country. So what did I learn from these interviews? There are five big takeaways. Number one, that first step you take out of your comfort zone, you're going to be scared. We are normally very averse to fear, with the exception Oh, Debbie Shear. <laughs> and you need to embrace the fear. It does not mean that you're on the wrong path. It probably means that you're on the right path. Number two, there's never going to be a perfect time. So if there's something that you want to do, don't wait for all the money in your bank account and the right size clothes. Number three, to get through, just be better than yesterday. Don't worry about yesterday or tomorrow. Don't worry about last year or tomorrow. Just be better than yesterday, and that's how you persevere. And number four, say it out loud. Do not keep your plans secret, and you will get support from the universe, from your friends, from the person next to you in your seat. And number five, for my story, if somebody gives you an opportunity because they recognize your, risk, your gifts and your talents, take them up on it. <laughs> so that said, I just want to say one thing. Take one step. Take one opportunity. Take one risk. Take help. But do something and do it as soon as you can.